The Day the Earth Stood Still. It's the movie that stirred my interest in science in the 1950s. Today we have for you the radio version, also starring Michael Rene as Klaatu. It's the day the Earth stood still on Radio Classics at the RadioDadio.com. The Hollywood Radio Theater. Michael Rennie and Jean Peters in The Day the Earth Stood Still. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. There is an ever-present question that has puzzled and intrigued our world for centuries. Is there life on any of the other planets? So in tonight's play, we will tell you of a possible momentous event in our future. The arrival of this planet, on this planet, of a man from the outer space. The day the Earth stood still. And as our stars of this provocative drama from 20th Century Fox, we have one of their fastest rising stars, Michael Rennie, co-starring with that outstanding actress, Jean Peters. Now, act one of The Day the Earth Stood Still, starring Michael Rennie as Klaatu and Jean Peters as Helen Benson. <laughs> It was a pleasant spring day, an ideal day for a walk in the park, a day to push the baby buggy and be glad you were alive. There'd been at least 20 such sparkling days that spring, and perhaps a billion or more of them since the earth began, and nothing had ever happened to spoil them but a few small fires or a slight head cold in the evening or a rain squall. This spring day in the middle of the marvelous 20th century was different. It was the most different day that had happened to mankind since the first Christmas. The thing was noticed in Hong Kong first on the British radar. But that's impossible. That thing must be doing about 4,000. That can't be aircraft, sir. It must be a buzz ball. Better give an alarm. Keep it steady, though. Maybe faulty equipment. If the British radar in Hong Kong was faulty, so was the radar all over the Orient and Asia and Europe. So were the announcers on the radio. This is Moscow. This is Calcutta, India. This is Radio Luxembourg. The American radar screen quickly confirmed the fact that there was nothing wrong with the British radar and that there was something very gravely wrong 40 miles out in space, far above the Earth. Lucton at Ferris to Baker. Ferris to Baker. I have an object at two zero zero thousand feet. Four zero 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 miles an hour. Then it was here. Incredibly, it was here. Burning down through the sky over Washington, D.C., hovering over the mall. Descending. Not a sound. Stillness. Not a move from the cordon of tanks and armored cars and troops in full battle dress. Not a sound or gesture from the monstrous domed disc resting on the grass. The ship designed for travel outside the Earth's atmosphere landed in Washington today at 3.47 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We still do not know where it came from. The ship is now resting exactly where it landed two hours ago. So far, there is no sign of life from inside the ship. Behind the cordon of troops, tanks, and artillery is a huge crowd of curiosity seekers. Every eye, every weapon is trained on the ship. The atmosphere is one of terrific tension rather than of fear. It's been that way for... Just a minute, ladies and gentlemen. I think something's happening. The spaceship is opening up. Someone is coming out. Keep calm, everybody. Don't get excited. Keep calm. Quiet. A wedge is opened in the smooth, unbroken metal skin of the spaceship. A ramp slithers out on the grass. Against an eerie glow of unearthly light from inside the spaceship stands the spaceman. He is a man, entirely like ourselves. He wears a close-fitting suit like a deep-sea diver's armor, but of alien material. A spherical helmet entirely conceals his head. 
He holds up his hand. He is going to speak. We have come to visit you in peace and with goodwill. Receive me as a friend. Here he comes, men. Watch it. Keep that B.A.R. trained on him. He, he's going for something in his tunic, sir. Quiet. It's a ray gun or something. I'm going to let him have it. No, no, wait. You fool, he's down. Hold back that crowd. Everybody, back. Your wound doesn't look too bad. I'm sorry, but you shouldn't have gone for that ray gun. It, it was not a weapon. He understands us. It was a gift for your president. With it, you might have studied life on other planets. What's bothering the crowd, Lieutenant? Tell him to... Oh, no. Oh, no. A nightmare stands on the ramp leading out of the spaceship. A mechanical giant, monstrous, all metal and menace, with a visor in his helmet lifting slowly, revealing a dreadful light boiling within that metal head. And suddenly, out of that incandescence, a narrow ray. <laughs> Rifles, tanks, artillery glow with that terrible incandescence and become vapor in a mush of puddle steel. And in the deathly silence that follows, the robot strides down the ramp. The Avenger. From where? God! The Glatch of Rusko! Won't hurt you now. Let's get you to a hospital. Good afternoon, uh, sir. Good afternoon. The doctors here tell me your wound is not serious. No. It amazes them that it's almost healed already. Oh, I'm very glad. It should serve as some sort of indication of our powers. My name is Harley, secretary to the president. I've been told you speak our language fluently, that your name is Mr. Klatu. Just Klatu. The president has asked me to convey our deepest apologies for what has happened. Sit down, Mr. Harley. I'm sure I don't have to point out that your arrival was something of a surprise. Uh, had you been traveling long? About five months. Your months. Oh, you must have come a long way. About 250 million of your miles. Uh, naturally, we're very curious to know where you come from. From another planet. Let's just say that we're neighbors. It's rather difficult for us to think of another planet as a neighbor. I'm afraid in the present situation you'll have to learn to think that way. The present situation? I mean the reasons for my coming here. Would you care to talk about it? Not now, or with you alone. Perhaps you'd rather discuss it uh, personally with the president. I want to meet with the representatives from all the nations of the Earth. I'm afraid that would be a little awkward. Why? In view of the tensions and suspicions in our world today, such a meeting would be uh, impossible. Mr. Harley, my mission here concerns the existence of every last creature who lives on Earth. It must not be complicated by the childish jealousies, intrigues, suspicions of your planet. Our problems are very complex. You uh, mustn't judge us too harshly. I'm in patience with stupidity. My people have learned to live without it. The President will, of course, do his best to bring about the meeting you desire. I know it will be quite useless. I wish it were otherwise. I'm very sorry, Mr. Clatoo. Wait. Before making any grave decisions, I think I should get out among your people. Become familiar with the basis for these strange, unreasoning attitudes. Our military people insist that you do not attempt to leave the hospital. The door will be locked. I'm sure you understand. Good day, Mr. Clatoo. door will be locked. <laughs> will it now? Plato escaped. Nor could the embarrassing news of his disappearance long be suppressed. It was read about in the papers and described in excited tones over the radio. The authorities at Walter Reed Hospital still refuse to comment on how he managed to escape, except to say that he broke into a hospital locker and stole clothing belonging to a staff doctor. While the government does not minimize the crisis... This was the latest and the only the news. And among the countless millions listening were two men and a woman in an ordinary home on an ordinary street in Washington. Mrs. Crockett's rooming house. We are warned, however, there was Mrs. Crockett and Helen Benson and little Bobby Benson. We may be up against powers that are beyond our control or understanding. Oh, and the... I just can't stand any more of this. Oh, I wanted to hear more, Mrs. Crockett. It's exciting, isn't it, Mother? Hush, Bobby. Exciting? It's enough to drive a person... Uh, oh! 
Who are you? I'm sorry. Oh. I saw your sign outside and the door was open. My name is Carpenter. Yes? I'm looking for a room. Oh, oh, oh yes. Oh, I do have a nice room. Are you a G-man? No, I'm afraid I'm not. I bet he is, Mom. I bet he's looking for that spaceman. I think we've all been hearing too much about spacemen, Mr. Carpenter. This is Mrs. Benson, Mr. Carpenter. How do you do? And this is little Bobby, my youngest guest. Hi. I'm Mrs. Crockett. <laughs> You're a long way from home, aren't you, Mr. Carpenter? How did you know? Oh, I can tell a New England accent every time. This way, please, Mr. Carpenter. And so this Sunday morning, we ask the question that has been plaguing the entire world for two days now. Where is the creature, and what is he up to? Eat your cereal, Bobby. Oh, Mom, I'm on muscle as it is. Bobby. Okay, Mr. Carpenter. I'm sorry, Mrs. Crockett. Please, go on reading. Um, creature, and what is he up to? Uh, if he can build a spaceship that can fly to Earth, and a robot that can destroy our tanks and guns... What other terrors can he unleash at will? What a man. Obviously, we must track down this monster and destroy him before he destroys us. Correct. Then why don't they do it? This spaceman, or whatever he is, we automatically assume he's a menace. Maybe he isn't, after all. Well, then where is he, Mrs. Benson? What's he up to? Maybe he's afraid. Oh, he's afraid. Well, after all, he was shocked the minute he landed here. I just was wondering what I'd do. Perhaps before deciding upon a course of action, you'd want to know more about the people here. Nothing strange about Washington. A person from another planet might disagree with you. <gasps> oh, it's all right, Mrs. Crockett. That's Mr. Stevens calling for me. Uh -huh. I'll go to the door. That awful robot standing there like an ugly iron statue. Give me the show. Morning, Tom. Hello, Helen. <laughs> Nobody see us? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, all right, we're all set. I picked up some sandwiches and put gas in the car, and the radio is busted, so we can forget about the spaceman for the day, huh? I haven't been able to arrange for anyone to stay with Bobby. Mrs. Crockett's going out, and uh, I don't suppose we could take him with us. Oh. Well, we could. Just today. Mrs. Crockett has plans, and I don't know who else to ask. I haven't any plans. Oh, Mr. Carpenter. I'd be glad to spend the day with Bobby, if you'd let me. Oh, great, thanks. Well, it's very nice of you to offer. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Carpenter, this is Tom Stevens. Hi. How do you do? Bobby and I had a fine time yesterday afternoon. I thought he might show me around the city today. Well... Please, I'd enjoy it. And this is where my father is buried. Robert Benson, Virginia, 1st Lieutenant, 45th Infantry. April 10th, 1916, January 29th, 1944. Your father was very young, wasn't he, Bobby? He was killed at Anzio. Did, did all these people here die in wars? Well, most of them. Didn't you ever hear of Arlington Cemetery? I'm afraid not. You don't seem to know much about anything, Mr. Carpenter. I've been far away, Bobby. Don't they have places like this where you've been? Not like this one. You see, they, they don't have any wars. Let's walk. All right. What would you like to do now? Go to the movies. All right. No fooling? No fooling. Uh, do you have to have money to go there? Well, I've got two dollars. I'll treat you, okay? No, I want to take you. Look, do you think they'd accept these? Well, gee, what are they? Diamonds? Well, in some places, these are what people use for money. They're easy to carry and they don't wear out. I'll bet they're worth a million dollars. Could you give me your two dollars for two of these? Sure, okay. There you are. Um, well, let's not say anything to Mom about this, huh? Why not? Well, she doesn't like me to take advantage of people. Hey, before we go to the movies, would you like to see the Abraham Lincoln Memorial? Thank you. Yes, I would. Well, this is it. That's the Gettysburg speech up there. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Those are great words. That's some statue. That's the kind of man I'd like to talk to. Bobby, who is the greatest man in America today? Oh, gee, I don't know. The spaceman, I guess. <laughs> I was speaking of Earthmen. Oh, I don't know. The president? I mean the greatest philosopher, the greatest thinker, scholar. Oh, well, that's Professor Barnard, I guess. 
Yes, Professor Barnhart. He's the greatest scientist in the world. He lives right here in Washington. Right near where my mother works. Where is that? Department of Commerce. She's a secretary. Why? I have an idea, Bobby. Let's go see Professor Barnhart. What for? You just said he's the greatest man in America. Are you kidding, aren't you? Wouldn't you like to meet him? Oh, sure I would. Ah, oh, go on. I bet you'd be scared. Maybe we can scare him more than he can scare us. I like you, Mr. Carpenter. You're a real screwball. Gee, maybe the professor isn't at home. Let's take a look through that window. I'll bet this is where he works. Look in there. Books all over. Blackwood's full of stuff. That door's locked, too. Is it? I know it isn't, Bobby. Well, that's funny. We'll go in and wait for him. I'm sure he won't mind. Gee, just think. All the brains that goes on in here. Well, what's all that stuff on the blackboard? It's a problem in celestial mechanics. And what's the matter? You'll never get the answer that way. Let's see. Hey, it says don't erase. Don't touch. Now, this is right. Check. Correct. Correct. And here's where he gets off the track. Now we'll fix that. So, so. You must be an arithmetic teacher, I bet. Differentiate the equation there. Who are you? Uh oh. How dare you come in like this? How dare you rise on that blackboard? Do you realize the professor's been working on that problem for weeks? He'll solve it in no time now. What do you want? He came to see Professor Barnhart. Well, he's not here, and he won't be back until evening. I think you better leave. Will you tell him that Mr. Carpenter was here? 1615 M Street, Northwest. I think he'll want to talk to me. Indeed. Thank you. Oh, it may have entered your mind to erase what I've written on the blackboard. It certainly has. I wouldn't do that. The professor needs it very badly. Come on, Bobby. Carpenter, 1650 M Street, Northwest. Carpenter, M Street. Operator, give me the police. Letters that come to this show from servicemen bear postmarks from all over the world. And it's plain to see that, well, they're having a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions among people of other lands. They're finding out, too, that these ideas of other people aren't so strange after all. They take the matter of dancing as an example. In many countries, dancing between the sexes is unknown. They dance for each other. They think the Western habit of dancing together is pretty vulgar. And in the countries of Europe, every country has its own favorite type of dancing. In France, it's the bourree. In Spain, the fandango. In Italy, the tarantella. In Central Europe, the hora. These are national dances, and the steps might seem strange and unfamiliar to the traveler. But uh, as our servicemen have observed, it might be just as hard for us to explain jitterbugging. The gyrations of our teenagers rival any movements of any group around the world for sheer energy of nothing else. The same is true of all customs and traditions in every country. The way of doing things may be different, but the ideals are the same. The strangeness of people begins to wear off when you start to understand them. Their customs and traditions begin to make sense when you understand the reasons behind them. And our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill between us and the people of other countries by observing these customs, by learning about them and honoring them. And now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of The Day the Earth Stood Still, starring Michael Rennie as Plateau and Jean Peters as Helen Benson. <laughs> It is early evening of the same day. Tom Stevens and Helen Benson drive up to the boarding house after their picnic, quite unaware of the dark squad car parked at the curb a few feet ahead. Well, here we are. Thank you, Tom. It was a wonderful day. You uh, still haven't answered my question. You know how I feel, Tom. But I still want time to think it over. <laughs> If I could only tell the boss I was getting married and acquiring two dependents. You're a good salesman. Uh, a good salesman wouldn't give you time to think about it. <laughs> good night. Uh, didn't you forget something? No. 
Now, good night. <laughs> good night. Good night. Oh, Mr. Carpenter. Hi, Mom. Hello, darling. Uh, Mrs. Benson, this is Mr. Brady. How do you do? How do you do? Well, Mr. Brady's a government agent. Oh? Did you have a nice day, Bobby? We had a swell time, didn't we, Mr. Carpenter? Yes, we did. We went to the movies and had a banana split, and we went to see Daddy. Oh, I don't know how to thank you, Mr. Carpenter. I enjoyed every minute of it. We better get going. Yes, good night, Bobby. Good night. I'll tell you the rest of that story tomorrow. Good night, Mrs. Benson. Good night. Nice meeting you, Mrs. Benson. Thank you. Why did Mr. Carpenter have to go with Mr. Brady? I don't know. Maybe it was a mistake. Upstairs with you. Yeah. We sure had fun today. We went all over Washington. We went to see Professor Barnhart. Professor Barnhart? Oh, sure. Barnhart? Up to bed now. Pronto. <laughs> Is uh, this the man you want to see, Professor Barnhart? Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Brady. If I may speak to Mr. Carpenter alone, please. I'll wait outside, Professor. You are Mr. Carpenter? Yes, Professor. Who wrote those equations on my blackboard? My clumsy way of introducing myself. Forgive the manner in which you were picked up. Hilda called the police before I saw your annotations on the board. I appreciate the need for security, Professor. I have not quite fathomed the problem, even with your remarkable assistance, Mr. Carpenter. Let's look at it, sir. All you have to do now is substitute this expression at this point. Yes, that will reproduce the first order term. But what about the effect of the other terms? Negligible. With variation of parameters, this is the answer. How can you be so sure? Have you tested this theory? I find it works well enough to get me from one planet to another. Plateau. I spent two days at your Walter Reed Hospital. I was interviewed by... I need no proof. This blackboard is proof. If you're not interested or if you intend to turn me over to the army, we needn't waste any more time. Interested? Will you excuse me one moment, please? Uh, Mr. Brady, you may go now. Please thank General Cutler and tell him... Tell him that I know this gentleman. So much for that, Clatoon. Now, please sit down. You have faith, Professor. Faith and uh, uh, curiosity. Uh, do sit down. I have several thousand questions to ask you. I would like to explain my mission here. That is my first question. It was my hope to discuss this officially with all the nations of the world. I was not allowed the opportunity. Now, we know from scientific observation that your planet has discovered a rudimentary kind of atomic energy. We also know that you're experimenting with rockets. Yes, that is true. What exactly is the nature of your mission? To warn you that your planet faces danger. What I have to say must be said to all concerned. I come to you as a last resort. Must I take drastic action in order to get a hearing? What sort of action do you mean? Violent action? Perhaps... Leveling the island of Manhattan? Or toppling the rock of Gibraltar into the sea? Well? Would you, for example, be willing to meet with a group of scientists I'm calling together? We are having our first meeting tonight. Perhaps you could explain your mission to them, and they in turn could present it to their various peoples. That is what I came to see you about. One thing, Klaatu. Suppose this group should reject your proposals. What is the alternative? There is no alternative, Professor. In such a case... The planet Earth would have to be eliminated. Such power exists? I assure you, such power exists. The uh, scientists who are attending these meetings have come here from all over the world. Now, this power you speak of, they must be made to realize that it exists. Now, you mentioned a demonstration of force. Yes. Something that would affect the entire planet? That can be arranged. Uh, perhaps uh, a little... Uh, demonstration. <laughs> Something dramatic, but not destructive. It's quite an interesting problem. Would tomorrow be all right? If you say so. Say about noon? Then tomorrow at noon. Good. Going out tonight, Mrs. Benson? Oh. Oh, it's you, Mr. Carpenter. I'm afraid I startled you. Yes, I am going out. Mr. Stevens is calling for me. Everyone seems so... so... 
Jittery is the word. <laughs> Bobby's the only person I know who isn't jittery. He's a fine boy, Mrs. Benson. Naturally, I think so. Warm, friendly, intelligent. He's the only real friend I've made since I've been here. Mr. Carpenter, this is none of my business, but why did that detective come here last night, that Mr. Brady? Bobby and I tried to see Professor Barnhart in the afternoon, but he wasn't in. Apparently, they thought I was looking for secrets of some kind. Well, that must be Tom now. Oh, Mr. Stevens, do come in. Helen is in the sitting room. Alert Mrs. Crockett. She has a romantic mind. Hello there, Helen. Got a minute to spare. Are you ready? Hello, Carpenter. Uh, picture starts at 8.50 on the dot, Helen. I'll be ready in a minute. I was just talking to Mr. Carpenter. Oh, I hope Mr. Carpenter won't think I'm intruding. Excuse me. I was just going up to my room. Good night. Good night, Mr. Carpenter. Have a good time, both of you. Thank you. Tom, that was awful. Uh, I'm sorry. I guess I'm just tired of hearing about Mr. Carpenter. Mr. Carpenter. I don't like the way he's attached himself to you and Bobby. After all, what, what do you know about him? Very little, it's true. Well, let's not stand and talk about it anymore. I'll go up and get my things. <laughs> Mr. Carpenter, thanks a lot for helping me with my homework. That's all there is to it, Bobby, my boy. All you have to remember is, first find the common denominator, then subtract. I got you. Thanks, Mr. Carpenter. I'm leaving with Tom, Bobby. You'll go to bed on time now, won't you? I'll say goodnight again, Mrs. Benson. Mr. Carpenter... Yes? Nothing. Good night. Good night. Night, Bobby. Bobby, I think it would be better if you didn't see quite so much of Mr. Carpenter. Well, gee, why, Mom? He's swell. I like him. And he's awful good at arithmetic. He even helped Professor Barnhart. I... I'm sure he's a very nice man. I just think he might prefer to be left alone. Now go to bed, darling. But why would he want to be left alone? Don't forget to brush your teeth. Come in. Bobby, do you have a flashlight I might borrow for tonight? Oh, sure, Mr. Carpenter. It's a real Boy Scout one. Thank you, Bobby. Why do you want it? The light in my room went out. See you tomorrow. Better get into bed now. Gee, I wonder if the batteries are any good. Mr. Carpenter! Bobby went to the door and opened it. What he saw down the hallway puzzled him. Mr. Carpenter's door was ajar and light was pouring out of his room. Funny. He said his light went out. Then Mr. Carpenter came out carrying the flashlight and stealing down the steps like a thief. This was peculiar, but this was adventure. Bobby followed Mr. Carpenter, and what he saw couldn't have been a dream. It was too real. But it couldn't have been true either. It was too deliciously frightful. Dream or not, it was filled with darkness stung by staccato flashes from a genuine Boy Scout flashlight. Flashes that activated a giant robot into knocking out his guards so that Mr. Carpenter from the boarding house could get into the shed the army had built around the spaceship. And dream or not, Bobby saw this Mr. Carpenter go into the spaceship. And then a wave of sheer terror swept over Bobby at last, and he turned and ran wildly away, the way little boys always run in nightmares, trying so hard and moving so slowly and all the time falling down. It was awful. It was swell. When his mother came home around midnight, Bobby was curled up on the sofa. Instantly, he jumped up and ran to her and to Tom Stevens as they came into the hallway. Mom, Mom, listen. Bobby, what are you doing down here at this hour, fully dressed? Oh, Mr. Stevens, Mom, I had to tell you. Tell me what? What's the matter, Bobby? I followed Mr. Carpenter tonight, right after you left, and gee, where do you think he went? Right into the spaceship. Now, Bobby, just one minute. Honest, Mom, I saw him. They got a shed built around the spaceship so nobody can get to it. But Mr. Carpenter flashed a signal to that Iron Man up there. And what do you think? Bobby, have you been dreaming again? What, sure. No, Mom, honest, I haven't. I promise you, I saw it. Where, where did you see all of this? Well, I'm telling you, on the lawn, down at the mall. In that place where the soldiers are all out in front. Uh-huh. And where were the soldiers all this time? Well, that robot fella grabbed him and knocked him out. Oh, Bobby. Yeah, and then Mr. Carpenter walked into the shed, and the spaceship opened up, and he walked right inside, and it closed again. Gee, I like Mr. Carpenter, but I'm scared, Mom. Darling, it was just a bad dream. We'll prove it to you. Tom, will you see if Mr. Carpenter's still up? Ask him to come down here a minute. Helen. Yes, Tom? 
Tell him he's not there, but look what I found on the carpet. It can't be a diamond, can it? I don't know. But it's much too big. Oh, it looks real to me. Oh, Mr. Carpenter's got lots of them. He gave a couple of them to me. Here. He gave you these? Well, not exactly. I gave him two dollars. I, I, I don't know, but this whole thing, it just does, that doesn't make sense. Look, Helen, do you think it's all right for you to stay here? There's a strong lock on my door. And Bobby's going to sleep in my room tonight. Okay. Upstairs, nightmare boy. It wasn't a nightmare. Bobby. Yeah, Mom? Bobby, your shoes are soaking wet. Yeah, grass on the mall was kind of wet. Good night, all. Oh, Tom. I wonder... Klaatu had promised what Professor Barnhart termed a little demonstration. Promised it for the following day at noon. It is now two minutes to twelve. In the Department of Commerce building, Helen Benson has left her office on her way to lunch. She stands in the corridor waiting for an elevator. Mrs. Benson. Mr. Carpenter. What are you doing here? I came to see you. Well, I was just going to lunch. What is it? I saw Bobby this morning before he went to school. Yes? I want to know what he told you. <laughs> oh, Bobby has such an active imagination. Did you believe what he told you? Really, Mr. Carpenter, this is where I work, and I only have a short time for lunch today. If you'll excuse me... I'll go down with you. If you like. The service elevator's open. You'll have to press the button, Mr. Carpenter. Oh, yes, yes. It was just five seconds before noon of that fateful day when Helen Benson and Mr. Carpenter stepped into that electric elevator. At that same moment, the enormous commerce of our briskly modern world roared and thundered in the streets. Five seconds to noon. Four seconds. Three seconds. Two seconds. One. Zero. High noon. And silence. All over the world, traffic stopped dead in a million streets. Here and there, a horse-drawn vehicle clopped its melancholy way among the motionless motors. Bicycles moved before awe and the common desolation made the riders stop of their own free will. Electric clocks stopped on the dot of noon. All across the powered world, the machines stood still. Toasters failed to pop and battle fleets on maneuvers drifted aimlessly on their dead propellers. Joe Smith's milkshake didn't spin and the humming turbines deep in Hoover Dam didn't produce current. Mrs. Housewife's washer stopped in the middle of its cycle, and electric lights went out all over the world. At a conference table in Washington, a hasty council of the armed services was held. As far as we can tell, gentlemen, all electric power has been cut off all over, with few exceptions. And even these exceptions are remarkable. Hospitals, planes and flight, that sort of thing. I wish I could be more specific, but all communications are out. I can tell you that we are preparing to declare a state of national emergency, but before we start discussing plans, I want to report from Colonel Ryder. All I can report, General, is that the robot at the spaceship was discovered to have moved last night. It knocked unconscious the two soldiers guarding the entrance to the shed the Army engineers had built around the spaceship, indicating that someone, presumably the spaceman, had wanted to get into the ship for one reason or another. And I'll likely hit the signal for this demonstration of his planet's power. Go on, Colonel. Well, that's all, sir. Well, gentlemen, until now, we've agreed on the desirability of capturing this man alive. We can no longer afford to be soft in this matter. We will get him alive if possible, but we must get him. Is that clear, gentlemen? Dead or alive? Get him. <laughs> You know, with our servicemen stationed in so many countries around the world, they have a wonderful opportunity to observe the customs and traditions of other people. They're finding out that these customs aren't so strange after all. For instance, in many countries, what is known as puberty rights still exist. 
These are celebrations, sometimes accompanied by singing and dancing, of a child growing up. Before he takes his place among the adults, he may be required to show his courage, his knowledge of the history and customs of his people, his ability to be a good member of that group. Among some primitive groups, this may even include physical torture of one sort or another. While this might sound strange, but as our servicemen have observed, it has its counterpart in our own life. The initiation ceremonies of high school or college fraternities, the coming out parties of debutantes, the bar mitzvah among members of the Jewish faith, these are all examples of the same thing. Actually, the mental and physical examinations that a young man takes before he puts on the uniform of his country are merely scientific tests to ensure the same thing, to see if he's qualified to take his place among others. And this is true about customs and traditions of all countries. The way of doing things may be different, but the ideals are the same. Our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill by observing these customs, by learning about them and honoring them. This, after all, is one of our traditions, to let the other fellow have the same rights and privileges that we want for ourselves. We pause now for station identification. Curtain rises on Act Three of The Day the Earth Stood Still, starring Michael Rennie as Tattoo and Jean Peters as Helen Benson. All over the world, electric power has been neutralized on the stroke of noon as a token of the spaceman's power and as a warning to the Earth. While they've been trapped between floors in an elevator, the spaceman has told Helen his identity and purpose here. I told you more than I told Professor Barnhart, because my life, in a sense, is in your hands. But if I die, a world, your world, may die too. Yes, I... I understand. I thought if you knew the facts, you'd appreciate the importance of my not being caught before the meeting tonight with the world scientists. Yes, of course. Of course I do. You hold great hope for this meeting, don't you? I can see no other hope for your planet. If the meeting should fail, then I'm afraid there is no hope. Oh, the lights... And we started again. It must be 12.30. Yes, exactly. Where are you going now? Back to the boarding house. I'll be safe there for the afternoon. I'll be able to keep an eye on Bobby. He's the only other person who knows about me. No. Wait a minute. There is someone else. How? They can't be. Tom. He was with me last night when Bobby told me what he saw. Well, of course, he doesn't know anything definite, and... Well, he talked to me first before... But then we can't take a chance, can we? Can you get in touch with him? I think so. I mean at once, now. I'll try. You will. You must. Hello. Hello. Operator, I was connected with my party. Please. Hello? Oh, is this Mr. Tom Stevens' office again? We were discon... Well, I must speak to Mrs... No... Mr. Stevens, yes, this is Mrs. Benson. Benson! Well, when do you expect him in, then? Well, will you tell him I called, and please, not to leave his office. I'm coming down to see him. Yes, yes, it's very important. To you, too. Margaret, this is Mrs. Stevens. I just got in. Now, listen, call the Pentagon. Who? Mrs. Benson, when? Uh, well... Yeah, n- never mind, this is more important. Listen, uh, call the Pentagon and find out who's in charge of the spaceman business. Whoever it is, I want to talk to him. Tom. Call me back right away and don't take any other calls. I'll brush him off fast. Tom, I've been trying to get you all afternoon. Well, I've got some pretty terrific news about your good friend, Mr. Carpenter. What about him? He's the man from the spaceship. I had that diamond or whatever it is checked at three different places. Nobody on Earth's ever seen a stone like that. And after what Bobby's told us, that's enough for me. Why is it nobody knows about this Mr. Carpenter? Why hasn't he got any money? All right, Tom. It's true. Yeah. How do you know? You've just got to promise me you won't say a word to anybody. Oh, nobody but the Pentagon. Please, Tom. Are you crazy? After what happened today, he's a menace. You don't understand. You don't realize how important this important. is. Important. Of course it's important, and we can do something about it. You mustn't it. do anything about it, Tom. Believe me, I know what I'm talking I about. I say he is dangerous. It is our duty to turn him in. He isn't dangerous. He's 
He isn't a menace. He he told me what he came here oh, for. Oh, honey, don't be silly because you happen to like the guy. Do you realize what this will mean for us? I'll be the biggest man in the country. I'll write my own ticket. Is that what you're thinking about? Listen, somebody's got to get rid of him. Tom, I'm not going to let you do it. Tom, don't. Hello, Margaret. Yeah. General Cutler? Good. Now, hold on. You don't know what you're doing. It isn't just you and Mr. Carpenter. Mr. Carpenter. It's everybody. The rest of the world is involved. I don't give a hang about the rest of the world. I'm in this for me. Tom. Now, you'll feel different when you see my picture in the papers. <laughs> I feel different right now. Well, you'll see. You're going to marry a hero. I'm not going to marry anybody. Not even a hero. Hey, Helen. Uh, uh, hello? General Cutler? Uh, General, my name is Tom Stevens, uh, with a V. Uh, I, I have positive information about the spaceman and where he's staying. Right. <laughs> yeah, of course I'm sure. He is living in a boarding house at 1615 M Street, Northwest. Yeah, that is correct, gentlemen. Yes, I have all of it now, Mr. Stevenson. Thank you very much indeed. I don't want to talk to you further, but I haven't time now. We want to act on this. Yes, sir? Have Colonel Ryder deploy all Zone 5 units according to Plan B immediately. Investigate 1615 M Street, Northwest for presence of spaceman. Repeat. <laughs> Carpenter. Right here. Did you see Tom? What does he say? It's no good. It's too late. I got a taxi outside. Hurry. Attention zone five. Attention zone five. Man and woman observed entering taxi at 1615 M Street Northwest. Man is probably class two, alias Carpenter. Establish roadblocks according to plan Baker and maintain station. Remain on radio alert until further orders. I don't know. I think we may have been seen getting into the taxi. Where can you go? I'm sure Barnhart can arrange to hide me until the meeting tonight. Where's it going to be? At the ship. Now, look there. Army cars. Full troops in full gear. The alarm is out, all right. It's only a few more blocks to Professor Barnhart's. I'm worried about Gort. I'm afraid of what he might do if anything should happen to me. Gort? But he's a robot. He's a product of centuries of refinement. But what could he do without you? There's no limit to what he could do. He could destroy the Earth. And the city is swarming with patrol cars, hunting you. How can we tell them? They won't listen. You must listen. If anything happens to me, you must go to Gort. You must give him this message. Klaatu, Barada, Nikto. Gort. Klaatu, Barada, Nikto. Say it. Gort. Klaatu, Barada... Nikto. Gort. Klaatu, Barada, Nikto. Klaatu, Barada, Nikto. Remember those words. Klaatu, Barada, Nikto. Attention, phone five. Taxi cab moving north on 14th Street from Harvard Street. Man and woman in back seat. License number H O O one two. H O O one two. Section two, close in. This is your target vehicle. Driver will get out here. I'm going to try to run for it. If they get me, you get to Gort. Now. There he is. Stop him, shoot. Stop him, we'll fire. Mr. Carpenter. Gort, run. Never mind, I'll check the guy. Centuries, ages of superhuman, superplanetary skill had bred intuition and a dim power of reason into the enormously complex intelligence inside of Gort's metal brain case. When Helen Benson stumbled up to the shed that housed the space machine, the guards were not there. Then she saw them. They were lying inside, their rifles fused and bent. Gort somehow knew that Klaatu was dead. Gort was already on the move. He was on the move toward Helen. No! No! God, no! The visor of his helmet was opening on that cosmic incandescence within, seething with world ruin, aiming impassively at Helen. Helen 
Benson fainted. When she returned to consciousness, she was lying on a dais bathed in a soft, shadowless light in a chamber vaguely circular of completely unfamiliar build. She was in the space machine. Across the room stood Gort with his back to her and lying in front of him on a platform was Platoon. Stop it. Gort, the machine, the automaton, was applying electrodes to his master in a piercing, whining, maddening sound through the ship. Platoon moved. He sat up. Stood up. Mr. Carpenter. Hello. I... I thought you were... I was. They took me to an emergency hospital at the city jail. Gort broke in and took me back here. This technique can restore life in some cases, only for a limited time. How long? No one can tell. Time enough and more for me to go outside and speak to Professor Barnhart's scientists. I must speak to them. It's what I came for. Gort will put out the ramp. You people of Earth, you men of science, you are here from all over your world, Europe, Asia, representing many nations, many ideas. I am leaving soon. You will forgive me if I speak bluntly. The universe grows smaller every day. Where I come from, we believe there must be security for all, or no one is secure. This does not mean giving up any freedom, except the freedom to act irresponsibly. This is the message that I ask you to take back when you return to your native lands. Tell your people and your governments that we have created a race of robots whose function it is to patrol the planets and spaceships and preserve the peace. At the first sign of treachery, they will act automatically. Nothing you have here on Earth can stop them. The penalty for provoking their action is too terrible to risk. Your choice is simple. Live in peace or perish in violence. We shall be waiting for your answer. The decision rests with you. Gort Baringo. Remember. I'll remember, Mr. Carpenter. see him depart, and the people of the earth pondered upon the warning. In a moment, our stars will return. With our American servicemen in many countries around the world, they have a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions. What might have seemed strange before is becoming pretty familiar to them. For instance, among the Mohammedans, to drink coffee with anybody is regarded as a sacred rule of hospitality, a token of peace. The berries are roasted over a charcoal fire, and the coffee is allowed to boil three times. It's thickly sugared and served in very small cups. All this is traditional among the Mohammedans, but as our servicemen have observed, it's, well, it's simply their version of our mid-morning coffee break or our Afternoon tea party for our cocktail hour. It's a time for friends to sit down and relax. It's a time for conversation with a cup of whatever beverage suits the individual taste. And this is true of customs and traditions of all countries. The way of doing things may be different, but the ideals are the same. So it is by observing these customs that our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill with other people in other lands. And now here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. And here they are after two out-of-this-world performances, Michael Rennie and Gene Peters. <laughs> now, 
Mike, have you ever seen any UMOs? What's a UMO? An unidentifiable moving object. <laughs> yes, I saw several years ago in London. You mean during the war? No, when I was a very young actor. But the flying objects were later identified as ripe tomatoes and eggs and colored <laughs> And how about you, Jean? Seen any flying saucers? Oh, actresses aren't interested in such things, Irving. Now, Irving, what's in store for next week? Well, Mike, we're going from life in the future back to the charming era of the Roaring Twenties. It's a delightful, amusing story of a multimillionaire who, for sentimental reasons, presents an average happy family with $100,000 and almost ruins their lives. It's Has Anybody Seen My Gal? And as the stars of this highly entertaining comedy romance from the Universal International Studios, we have two of their most popular young stars, Rock Hudson and Piper Laurie, co-starring with that fine actor, Gene Lockhart. Oh, the whole family will love it. Good night. Good night. Good night and happy landing. by Mr. Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is under the direction of Rudy Schrager. This is Ken Carpenter inviting you to join us next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. Hollywood Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Radio Classics for this time around. Be sure to join me again soon when I'll bring you another episode from those golden days of my favorite medium. And remember, what's old is new again at theradiodaddio.com. I'm Dave Allen.